Today's guest first appeared on the show almost exactly three years ago, and he predicted that the real estate bubble would burst. Did it? And now he's back saying we're on a debt bender, and a lot of the blame goes to the banks and faulty economic theory. Really? I've got some questions I want to ask, and I want answers starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. My guest today is Hilliard Macbeth, an investment portfolio manager and author of When the Bubble Bursts, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. This is Mr. Macbeth's second appearance on the podcast. He first appeared way back on episode number 89 in May of 2016, just over three years ago. It was such a popular episode that we rebroadcast it as episode number 104 in the summer of 2016 as one of our most downloaded episodes. The first edition of his book was released in 2015, and the second edition of When the Bubble Bursts was released last year, and it's available on Amazon and in better bookstores everywhere. Now, here we are in June of 2019, that's when we're recording this, here in my office in downtown Toronto, and I've got one obvious comment, and I know it's the comment every listener and viewer on our YouTube channel is, who's watching this today is wanting to ask, and that comment is this, you are wrong. The bubble didn't burst. Like I said, we're here June 2019. We're recording this in my office in downtown Toronto at, at Young and King. And you can look around and see tons and tons of condos. And they all keep going up, 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 up in value. There's been no, no sign of any hiccups at all. So my first question to you, welcome to the podcast. Uh, how, how could you be so wrong on this? Well, before I before I get to that, uh, thank you for inviting me back on your show. It's really great nice to, to have you here. here, and it's nice to be in Toronto. And it is definitely a different feeling to be in Toronto. I've been here for a couple of days. I was speaking to a conference, and they they asked me to be the keynote speaker, which I I, I suggested to them. Why are you asking me to be the <laughs> keynote speaker? But anyway, we can get to that in a minute. But as far as being wrong, so depending on what um, market you look at. You could say I was right, and you could say I was wrong. So in Edmonton, for example, the peak was 2007. In Calgary, the peak was 2014. In uh, Vancouver, the peak was July of 2016, which I think is, I, I like the timing of my book coming out about a year before that, because that gives people a year to prepare. It takes a while to decide to sell your house if that's what you need to do to get rid of the debt that you have. So so the, the, the anomaly, although people who live in Toronto don't see themselves as an anomaly, but the anomaly is the Toronto market, which has, in parts of the Toronto market, in some uh, products or, or categories, I guess you could say, has continued to rise. Although, if you look around the outskirts of Toronto, in Vaughan and Newmarket and places like that, um, I could argue that I was right. The prices have been, are down 15 20% already. But of course, the way the real estate board measures that they include the condo prices and um, those have kept going up. Yeah, and I think the reason for that is if I work in downtown, I mean, I met with a guy yesterday on the other side of that wall here who lives in Hamilton, works in downtown Toronto. So he gets on the GO train in Hamilton, you know, takes it into Union Station and it's a short walk to the GO station on either way. So his round trip, he said, I think is like an hour and 15 minutes. Sorry, one way, an hour and 15 minutes. If you live in Oshawa and are coming into Toronto and you got to drive to the GO station, you know, you, you're looking at maybe a two-hour trip each way. Well, if I can buy a condo in downtown Toronto and save that two-hour trip, yeah. makes sense, right? Yeah. And and I think that's one of the reasons the condo market has been so strong, just transporting and getting here and it's such a hassle. And then you add to the fact that obviously an investor is much more likely to buy a condo because as you know, prices always go up. I think that's one of the chapters in your book here. So, and it's much easier to manage a condo. I don't have to cut the lawn. I don't have to, I can hire a property manager and, and I'm good. So I think that's probably the reason, and I'm not a real estate expert, but anecdotally, I think that's the reason that the condo market is so strong here in Toronto, downtown Toronto. But you're right. You look at the outlying areas and it's a, it's a totally different situation. So let's talk about why that is. Why have we had a boom in real estate prices over, let's say, the last 10, 20 years? Like, what, what is the cause of it? Because I read your book. In fact, I believe I read it twice. I think I read the first edition as well. And correct me if I'm wrong, but you make the point that if you were to take a look at real estate prices over a 200-year period, they basically don't go up. 
Am I correct in that? Like, is we, that they go up with inflation? With inflation, so inflation has been say under two percent for the last sixteen years. So, in total, the prices maybe would be up 30 40 percent and instead they're up 300 percent or 250 percent let's say so how is that possible why is that it's one word one four letter word <clears throat> debt Ooh, so, i should do a podcast <laughs> oh no wait a minute we are doing a podcast and that's why i wanted to have you on again because uh, yes debt debt is the reason that house prices are so high why is that so what happened, I, I, you know, this is not my regular job. My regular job is financial advice to families and managing portfolios for them. And I noticed in about 2003 that people were starting to become obsessed with real estate. And one of the things I remember, uh, almost like it was yesterday, uh, was one of the clients saying, my daughter is going to University of McGill. I should buy a condo so she can live in the condo mm-hmm, in McGill. And, mm-hmm. it's, and I'm thinking, that's a really crazy idea. And yet he was really serious. And then that was that was several more times, or probably a dozen times after that, I heard the same sentiment. And to me, it didn't make any sense. So I said, well, your daughter's only going to be there four years. Uh, what's going to happen after? Oh, it'll be a good investment. So I'll just keep it. <laughs> so, so, uh, uh, but what made all that possible was a belief that house prices always go up. That's the house and condo prices always go up is, the, is obviously cor- incorrect because we have had crashes in the past in Canada and especially elsewhere. Uh, but it is deeply ingrained. The second uh, belief that has become uh, deeply ingrained is mortgage debt is good debt. So you can take on as much mortgage debt. It's sort of the two kind of go together, but mortgage debt is good debt. And um, we can talk about the lender's attitude towards that as well in a minute, if you like. And the third one, which I don't know if, if all people actually think this, uh, you know, but uh, maybe more in the financial circles, a financial crisis is something that happens in another country to somebody else at some other time. Even though we've got evidence as Ireland, Spain, the United States of America, all over the world, there's been recently huge financial crises. I mean, there was only one bank in England that survived the 2009 crisis, Barclays. That's amazing. And then after that, they found out that Barclays had pulled this, <laughs> yeah. the scam with, with one of the Middle Eastern countries, or they would have also gone under. So so uh, Canadians are very, and, and, and I know, not to pick on downtown Toronto, but downtown Toronto is very, very um, uh, isolated in the sense that they, uh, become, maybe because the banks are headquartered here, but they have a very strong belief that our banks are very prudential, they're very safe, and nothing can go wrong. And in fact, the building we're recording this in 50 years ago was the Royal Bank. This yes. used to be their, their uh, I don't know if it was their head office, I guess it was. So banks are, what business are banks in? So banks actually are in the business of creating new money. So when it's, if everybody that's listening to this, if they've bought a house, I think, because I remember it really clearly myself, when you sign those mortgage documents, there is a deposit. In, in my case, when I did it years ago, it was $75,000. Today, it's probably $750,000. That money did what did not exist before you as soon as you sign that document and i guess the bank has to do something so maybe five minutes later there's a there's an account at the bank with seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and let's use that number that money did not exist anywhere before it, it is created out of thin air and only the banks have the ability or other lending institutions have the ability to do that so, so now that, that doesn't make sense to me because i go to the bank and i put money in my savings account and then the the money that I've put in my savings account at 0% interest, the bank is then lending that out to no, people no. at 3% interest or whatever. No. That's how the banks make their money. That's not the way it works. Not true. So, so the, and the really crazy thing about this is, and this is, so this is why the second edition, you may have some listeners that have read the first edition. It's really important to read the second edition because I added a whole new section on this, which came to light after the first edition came out. And I started meeting some of the non-Main Street economists in uh, England, and, in, and one of them lives in Amsterdam. And uh, that was my field. I went to graduate school in economics, and I was very interested. So I, I did all the research. I put some of it in the, uh, in the second edition. And it turns out that the banks can create money um, in an unlimited fashion uh, by issuing debt if in the form of a mortgage. And so that is the business they're in. And in- increasingly, now, that isn't the only business they're in. That's the main business they're in. They still do business loans. They still do auto loans. They still do credit cards. They still do all kinds of other stuff. They do wealth management, uh, the industry I work in. 
But all of those are fairly minor compared to the main business, which is creating new money. And usually it's with collateral in the form of real estate as the backing. Because think about, think about it from the bank's point of view. They can also create brand new money by going and getting a businessman to sign a document or a businesswoman to sign a document and they can give them a loan. But that's much riskier. They have to understand the business. They have to watch that the, the business doesn't cheat and steal the money. They, they have to worry about, is that a good business, a bad business, all that sort of stuff. In, in the real estate business, all they have to do is make sure they get the collateral. And remember, the lenders are also thinking uh, what I said at the outset, which is house prices always go up. So they don't really have to worry about the loans going bad. And to make it even worse, the last 20 or 30 years, um, there haven't been any really big problems with bad debts in the mortgage industry. So the tendency is for them to concentrate more and more in the mortgage lending real estate business. Listeners would be surprised to know that 40 years ago when I started, the banks weren't even in the mortgage industry. 1980, it was the trust companies. There were, there were specific mortgage companies that that's all they did was mortgages. Now, in that case, they didn't create new money. They had to get, a, uh, they had to get a, um, money from uh, an investor and then turn around and give it to the person. So what, what's the difference then? So, and I remember when I got my first mortgage, which was, I don't know, 1989, I think. Um, and it was, I believe it was Central Guarantee Trust Company, which of yeah. course has been absorbed into, I don't know who, who ended up buying yeah. them, but they've all been absorbed into somebody. You, yeah. you detail that in your book. So the trust company could not create money. Well, I, um, they might have been able, they might have had the ability to do that. Now, that's a really good question that I, I'd have to do more research in, whether they, there's a line that is crossed between um, uh, sort of like, uh, well, the, the, the better way to do it, the better way to do it is to think, and this requires that people imagine a few years ago, um, you're going to lunch. You don't have any cash in your pocket. You don't have time to go to the bank machine before lunch starts. You're meeting your friends. So you, you say to, you, to me, your coworker, can you give me $10 or $20 and I'll pay you back after lunch when I go to the bank machine? Sure. So I hand you the money. So now my pocket is minus $20 and your, your mm -hmm. pocket is plus $20. A traditional lending and then, arrangement. And that is um, lending, uh, and this is a short-term loan, but the, that's the traditional economic theory, the, the patient money, who's got excess money in his, in his bank account, gives it to the impatient money, the person who can't wait because he's got to get to lunch and it's only it's five to 12 already. And um, away they go. But, uh, but and, and in the, in the court, case of a mortgage being created, whose bank account goes down in value by $750,000 when that new mortgage is created. And that's the key to your argument, I guess. So, because the way you describe lending is, well, that's exactly what I would think. They take it from one person and lend it to another. They so, take it from my savings account and make it in a mortgage. Which of us has ever seen their bank account drop in value by 750,000 and the bank informs you says, well, we made a mortgage loan to to this young couple, so your bank, your, your well, your, but I would assume that's because there are a million customers of the bank, and we all have you know money invested at the bank, and you know the they're they've got more deposits than they're lending out or something like yeah. the so so why can't I then do the same thing? Because you don't have a you don't have the license as a commercial bank. And this is a special license. It's not a not something that's handed out willy nilly. It's a special thing, with the backing of the government. So, if you went out and created money out of thin air, and in fact, uh, if you go back a long time, uh, there were instances when um, when people did this, like maybe in the in the long time ago, the gold merchants, for mm -hmm. instance, could give a loan backed on collateral against gold, and they just created the piece of paper out of out of thin air, and that was the early early bankers. But, uh, but generally what would happen is if there was any problem with the loan, if a loan went bad, you'd be in big trouble and there'd be nobody backing you like a government or, or a central bank. And so, that's the key to banks being able to create money is they're backed by the government or the central bank. And there, but there is a limit. So, I, so now people don't have to take my word for this. Um, it's in my book, but, but there is a paper in 2014 by the Bank of England that explains this exactly what we're talking about. And I think the paper probably does a better job of explaining the mechanism. But the, the headline of the paper is 97% of all money in existence today was created by the banks making loans, most about two thirds of it for real estate backing. Uh, and it was made out, it created out of thin air. And the 3%, the, that's the 97%. The 3% 
is currency that we, you know, increasingly we don't carry currency around it's anymore. It's not a thing. Yeah. But that's how we think money gets created. So it's created. in the form of bank deposits that were created through the system. Now, it isn't like the banks can just go out and, and create unlimited amounts of money because remember, there has to be a willing borrower. There has to be collateral under the rules. There are rules. The bankers are following the rules. I'm not suggesting they're not following the rules. And there has to be some kind of judgment as to whether the, the borrower can repay that loan. Because if all of the people started to fail to repay the loan and had to come and see you in your other your business, then uh, very quickly the bank's capital would be eroded and it would be gone. So, so it isn't like they have this power, but they have to use the power uh, carefully because they could go out of business very quickly. And what kind of leverage can they use? So how much can they create based on whatever their capital is? So the banks roughly have a capital, um, and this was part of my talk yesterday uh, to the banking group, uh, or in between, it counted between 11 and 12%. So that would imply a leverage ratio of eight to nine times. But it's actually much higher than that because in Canada, we have a special situation where if there's CMHC insurance or one of the other, there's uh, there's Genworth and there's a small one named Canada Guarantee that can also insure your mortgage. And if that's on there, then the banks can also count that as almost zero. It's not quite zero. There's a, there's a small amount of, uh, of, of risk weighting. So in that case, there's virtually unlimited leverage. But in practice, it turns out that it's, it's close to 30 times leverage, which is interesting enough. Uh, it's unique to the Canadian banking system because uh, really no other country has this uh, mortgage insurance arrangement. Uh, they have mortgage insurance, but it's not of the scale that we have in Canada. And, and you know, to the credit of the head of CMHC, his name is Evan Siddell. He's been shrinking the the the, um, the liabilities of CMHC, but it's very, still very large. Uh, but that allows uh, tremendously high leverage, as high as thirty times, and um, and so therefore. Even a skinny profit, because the mortgage business is very competitive right now, and uh, the profits are, you know, the, they're talking 3.3% loans and stuff, and then you got to have, you got to service the mortgage, you got to do all that stuff. They outsource a lot of it, but still, um, the profit margins are not huge. But with that kind of leverage, it ends up that the Canadian banks are the most profitable in the world. Well, and the biggest bank makes a billion bucks a month, so that yeah. sounds pretty profitable to me. Yes, so. and about, about half or even between 50 and 70% of that is related to what we're talking about today. Yeah, mortgages and the real estate industry. And, and everything, could, yeah. So so banks are in two businesses. They create money and they're in the real estate business, the real estate lending business. Yes. So if you look at their overall portfolio, yes, they have credit cards. Yes, they loan to business. But the the majority of it, and maybe the vast majority of it, is tied to real estate. That seems like, pretty risky to me then because if the if you're right and the real estate market does deflate in fact even if it doesn't just keep going up then they could be in a pretty vulnerable position could they not yes so the uh, bank of canada staff paper that was put out in may uh, now the, the assumptions they use so they did an assumption for the next recession so obviously there's always another recession coming the interesting thing about where we sit here in 2019 and in in halfway through is we haven't had a recession in Canada for a long time. It's 10 years now. And even that recession 10 years ago was quite mild compared to previous recessions. So so the Bank of Canada assumed that we're due for a more severe recession. And uh, they took some pretty serious assumptions, like seven quarters of uh, recession. The average is six quarters. Uh, GDP decline of 8%. The average is probably 5 or 6%, and, and so on. You know, unemployment, that sort of thing. And they, they also assumed that uh, there would be big losses in consumer loans. Now, more, they don't count mortgages in consumer loans. Because remember, mortgage debt, as I said at the beginning, is good debt, right? And consumer mm -hmm. loans are bad debt. Mm -hmm. If people get into trouble, they come in to see you because of consumer loans. Mm -hmm. And um, and and they, they so the bottom line was they assumed that with all of the ripple effects and the second and third order effects, as economists call them, um, there would be about $114 billion in losses to the banking system. Uh, which is about 4% of total assets. And what that would do would take the 12%, 11 to 12% uh, common equity capital of the banking system down below 8%. So about a third of the capital in the bank system would be wiped out by those losses. But what bothers me about that paper is they assume that there will be almost no losses in the mortgage business. And the way they get to that is, first of all, about half of them are insured. So the, presumably the insurance company is going to take the loss, mostly CMHC. 
And the other half, there's a requirement of a 20% minimum down payment in the uninsured mortgage section. But uh, in reality, the banks look at it and say, well, heck, we have much higher, uh, you know, 30, 40% is average equity because they're including all the people that don't have mortgages and all that sort of thing. So, so they assume that uh, there will be very little losses. And then the governor of the Bank of Canada, to pile on, uh, did an interview on BNN with Amanda Lang uh, uh, early in June and said that uh, people would just keep paying their mortgages even though they're underwater on their mortgages. Now, it, it, there's, no way to, there's no way to know if that's true or not. In the U.S., people did keep paying their mortgages because in a lot of states in the U.S., you can't walk away from your mortgage. In Canada, you can't walk away from your mortgage unless you declare bankruptcy. So, uh, but bankruptcy, as you know, is, is quite a bit easier to go through than, than, um, than people realize. So, so, but given that people would be willing to suffer with a house that's worth 600000 and a mortgage that's worth 750000 for long periods of time, maybe the Bank of Canada is right. But I'm thinking that the mortgage uh, debt, which is the biggest debt that the banks have on their balance sheet, would generate bigger losses than that. And then if you, if you, if you, if you think that, then it could be quite a, a crisis. But even, even if you follow the Bank of Canada's reasoning in this paper, um, that $116 billion in loss takes their uh, equity, their equity capital down from 12 down to below 8, and they have to restore it back up to the minimums. So that's called the capital conser- conservation buffer, and they would have to get it back up there. Now, there's only two ways they can get it back up, and that is they can issue shares, but they won't want to issue shares because the shares will be at a low price, or they can suspend their dividends. Now, most people probably don't know this, but the Canadian banks have, going back to the 1800s, have rarely, if ever, suspended their dividends. So it would be a major... Um, That's why people invest question. in bank shares. Exactly. Bet a, it's better than a savings account. There's so, a constant dividend. So I presented this to this group of 120 people that were at this conference, and um, I could tell that they weren't buying it. <laughs> so <laughs> and then, so I was the first speaker, and then I, was, I went and sat at the back of the room. I think they thought I'd left because they made some very candid comments about my presentation because each panel that came up then after that for the rest of the day... The first thing the moderator did was ask the participants, most of whom were from, uh, some from uh, European banks, some from Canadian banks. This was a European conference that was organized in Canada. And they gave reasons why I was wrong. But the reasons were not very compelling. Like uh, one of them was um, our our, our delinquencies are at record low levels. Well, that's the way it works when you've got a housing bubble. Yeah. Why would anybody default? Like you see them every day, but people can keep refinancing as house prices go up. The problem starts when house prices stop going up and then and then they can't refinance. And that's already happening, I understand. Um, the other one, that, the other one, that one of the other ones was, uh, well, our whole system was set up by Scottish people and Scottish people are very, very conservative and prudent. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that, that didn't sound very convincing yeah. either. You know? not, not empirical evidence yeah, there, I don't yeah. think. So two final questions then. The, the the gist of your argument as to why we are in a bubble, and I guess we're already moving out of the bubble now, is is what? What is what is the reason why you believe real estate in Canada has been in a bubble for, you know, many years? Well, um, first of all, the, 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 the speed and the extent of the gains is just off the charts, right? There's, there's only one other major housing market in the world that's worse than Canada, that's Australia. And they're in a very similar situation. Um, overall gains of three times. And in Vancouver, before they started to drop in uh, a couple of years ago, four times gains. So that's generally never happened. Going back, I went back a couple hundred years. And it's, you know, generally, as we said at the beginning, house prices just go up at the rate of inflation. Um, and the second, secondly, the wages and salaries that support those housing prices have only gone up about you know forty to fifty to sixty percent, depending on what industry you're in. So, um, the the gap between the gains of two or three hundred percent in housing prices and only forty or fifty percent wages was filled by debt. So debt, ongoing piling on debt, which becomes harder and harder to service the bigger it gets, is the problem. And if there never was another recession, maybe it could go on forever. But as soon as you have a recession then some of those people that are stretched so far with that debt are going to start to default. And when they default, 
house prices will come down faster than they have. Now, in, in Alberta and BC, uh, Calgary, uh, Edmonton, and Vancouver, prices have already been coming down for, for uh, well, in the case of Calgary and Edmonton, quite a few years now, and Vancouver are about three years. And the total of all that is over 30% of the Canadian economy. So you can see that it's, it's, it's not possible to say that, that, well, that's just Alberta and BC, that doesn't count. Right? In Saskatchewan, I didn't add them in, but they would be in the same category. So so you'd be talking up to 35% of the of the Canadian GDP. Yeah, so what you're saying is it's math. Like yes. long-term, historically, over a couple hundred year period, real estate goes up by the rate of inflation. In the last 10, 20 years, it's gone up by four times. Well, that's just not sustainable. It's not going to keep going up by four times. Eventually, a condo in Toronto can't be worth $100 million because our wages are still what they were. You know, they haven't gone up anywhere near, near as much. So final question then is, what is your advice then? So, I mean, it's pretty clear you think that real estate is not where you should be throwing all your money. And yet, if we were to do a balance sheet for the average Canadian, and I'm making this up, so you tell me if I'm wrong here, but the balance sheet would have an asset called a house, and that'd be pretty much it. Like, yeah. we don't have savings anymore. That's not a thing we do. So owning a house, if I've got a million dollar home, but I've also got $10 million invested in a bunch of stocks and bonds and GICs, while well, the house goes down in value, eh, okay, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to kill me. But if my only asset is my house and it gets hammered, then I'm I'm totally over levered. I'm, I'm uh, not diversified. I have zero diversification. So you are of the view that we should be putting less emphasis on real estate. Should we all be selling and renting? Like, what are you telling people today? So in the in the section called surviving uh, the the crash, there's different there's different scenarios. Of course, there's older people, there's younger people, younger people who haven't bought yet. And I talked to one this morning at breakfast. Um, she's saving up her money to buy a house. And well, first of all, I told her do not buy a condo. Condos are the absolute worst investment there ever could be because you only get a small amount of land, and you get a very uh, you know ninety percent of your investment goes into the building, and the building is going to depreciate. So there's no way that the math works. Um, and of course, in that case, that means in most people's, young people's cases, that means they can't buy anything in the Toronto area because the mm -hmm. single family home is too expensive. Yep. Um, people that have already bought, if they're young and they have a massive amount of debt, they should sell because that's the only way they're going to survive this uh, crash. Now, if you get into older people, the baby boomer generation like myself, um, we're skipping over the X generation because there's so few of them that they, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> they but don't count. Uh, yeah, they don't count. But the baby boomer generation, there's a lot of them um, that have quite a bit of wealth in their home, but not much else saved for retirement. And uh, I think you said in one of your uh, reports that uh, it's one of the biggest, uh, fastest growing problem areas are baby boomers mm -hmm. that have. Uh, they want to maintain the house. They want to maintain the lifestyle. They want to help their kids buy real estate and they get into trouble and they end up coming to see you. So some of them should sell their house and rent. And that will, you know, I actually meet almost every week. I meet a baby boomer that could solve their retirement funding issue just by selling their house and renting. But they're very reluctant to do that because uh, especially in Alberta, uh, but I, I think probably in most parts of Canada, there's not a lot of protection for renters. You can be, you can be, you know, somebody just says, the owner can just say, well, I'm selling the place, so you got to get out. Or I'm going to move in myself, you got to get out. And so yep. legislation is required to protect people. But that would be the fastest way to, um, and, and, you know, and, and I think it, if it were me, I would rather not have the debt and put up with the inconvenience of possibly having to move as a renter because you can sleep a lot better at night and your financial future would be secure. Yeah, you sell your million dollar house. Now I've got a million dollars I can invest. And even if I'm only earning two or three percent or whatever it is, then that's a uh, money for the rest of my life. That's what supports me through retirement. If I keep the house, well, I've got to put money into repairs. Even if there's no mortgage, there's there's still a cost to that. Obviously, you got to weigh what it costs to rent and, and all the rest of it. Now, you yourself own a house. Yes. So you haven't taken your own advice then. Well, no, I have taken my own advice. So in the book, it says that if you're comfortable and you've got other investments and you don't owe any money on your house, there's no problem. Because uh, we do house. need a place to live. You're going to live somewhere. Yep. And, uh, but I am aware that it's going to cost me more money 
to keep the house than it would cost me to sell it and rent someplace else. But I don't need to sell it and rent. You know, yeah. Just, so if the market and you you're from Edmonton, yeah. you're based in Edmonton. So thanks for making the trip today. Um, if the house price in Edmonton crashes for you, well, I'm still living in the house. Yeah. It's it's a paper loss, and it's not going to change my lifestyle any because I've got other sources of income and all the rest of it. It's, it's the person who wants to sell their house in five years and retire and use that money. That's the massive danger zone because, well, you sell the house and the, the money you thought you were going to get just isn't there. That's the that's for, the huge Unfortunately, risk. for a lot of people in Edmonton, Calgary, and Vancouver, that point has already been reached where the, you know what they thought they were going to get when they sold their house and retire is, is much less than... than uh, it's too late. It would have been five. Well, it's not too late, but it's just not as... Not they, as good as it would have been two years now, ago. Or in Toronto, ago. if people, you know, the, so Toronto is kind of lucky in the way. Toronto's lucky in many ways. And this is <laughs> another way that Toronto's lucky is that people have been given a little bit more time. Um, my book came out early. As Jeremy Grantham said at a, at a uh, conference that I attended in 2003, so that was three and a half years before the financial crisis hit when he was predicting the financial crisis. He's quite a famous money manager based in Boston. He stood up in front of 320 portfolio managers and investment people and he said, I have never been wrong. I've been early. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then everybody and everybody la- erupted in laughter. I've yeah. been early. So if you're predicting these things, you want to be early because you want to give people a chance. Now, I, 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 I maybe I wasn't early enough for the people in Alberta because the book came out in 2015 and house prices had already peaked and were on a decline by then. But the people in Vancouver had a year. People in Toronto have been given... Well, depending on where you live in Toronto, maybe another extra year or two to make a decision. But most of them won't make a decision. Most of them will will even if they even if they read the book and even if they believe what I'm saying, they'll convince themselves that their situation is special and unique. That's just human nature. Right? Yeah, and, it, and it's not going to happen to me. And, and that's the problem. We, I mean, you talk about it in your book. You talk about recency bias and things like that. We we believe what we believe, and it's very difficult for you know, a baby boomer parent, you know, a parent who maybe is 60 years old, 65 years old, 50 years old, whatever they are, who have owned a house for the the last 30 years. It's gone up in value considerably. They want their kids to share in that same wealth creation. And so they're pushing their kids into owning a house. Your 30 years sounds like a long time, but 200 years is longer. And I think your point is you got to really step back and look at the, the big picture here. But it's very hard to do. And we, 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 we have the movie going in our head that we want to see. Yeah. And so you said last year that prices were going to go down and they didn't go down yet. Look at the condo. So therefore, you're wrong. Well, OK, I think if anything in the Toronto condo market, you're early. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. I could say the same thing about every single stock that's ever traded. Well, they go up, they go down. Oh, I think it's a little overvalued. That doesn't mean it can't keep going up. It it could correct. So I, I will say that in, in both of our books, we make the same point. And so everyone should go out and buy, you know, when the bubble bursts. Um, you've got it in chapter 11, where you say that a home is not an investment and I make exactly the same point in myth number 13, where I say a house is not a great investment. And, and the reason for that is exactly what you've said. They go up by the rate of inflation over the long term. That's, that's just the math. That's, that's just the way it is. So um, how can people keep track of what you are doing? What's the best way to stalk you? Twitter, <laughs> I assume, is that is that Twitter is good. Doing? And then I put out a weekly... Um, I'm going to write up this conversation in a weekly uh, note that I put out every week, um, which comes out on Friday, and everybody is free to subscribe to that. It's it's it, there's no charge, and you'll get a you'll get a, a copy sent to you, or we put it out on Twitter, and um, all you have to do is click on the link, and you can do it. And it's not always on housing; it's about in, it can be sometimes about investing, and sometimes it's about electric cars because I own a Tesla. <laughs> it's uh, it's whatever is interesting to me, or something that I want to research. So I spend a few hours researching something, then I write it up. And and, uh, and what's your Twitter handle? It's H-M-A-C-B-E. So H, H. for Hilliard, and, mm-hmm. then, and then, then the first letters of my last name, M-A-C-B-E. I got to admit, Hilliard Macbeth is like the best name ever. If it helps I, with the book, because oh yeah, man, that's uh, uh, people can find the book. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> there's there's nobody else with with that name. So yeah. 
So that is awesome. So there you go. Uh, look up Hilliard Macbeth on Twitter. And then uh, when the bubble bursts, it's it really is a great read. And you go into, you know, a bunch of some some economic history in it, but then I think make the, the compelling argument. And I know there's lots of people watching this who go, I don't agree with the guy. I think real estate's going to go up forever. It's fantastic. Okay, well, you should at least listen to the other side of the argument. And then you can you can make an informed decision. Hilliard Macbeth, thanks for being here today. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. That is our show for today. Once again, check out When the Bubble Bursts and uh, check out Hilliard Macbeth on Twitter. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30. <laughs> <laughs>